Panasonic has given us the details on the new GH5. They announced it back when we were at Photokina, but now we finally have all the information about it, and it's awesome. It's the most exciting camera of the year. Yeah, that's, that's a, a dad joke. Uh, by the way, we're streaming this live in 4K, so if you have problems, just subscribe. We'll republish it. We haven't ever streamed anything in 4K before. Frankly, it's kind of amazing. We can even stream live in 4K. Uh, it's going to cost you $2,000, and it won't be available until April of 2017. If you do want to pre-order it, please use our link, stp.io slash gh5. That helps to support us. We get a few pennies out of every dollar. One of the big updates is that it has a new sensor, a 20 megapixel sensor. Now, the GH5 is basically the best little video camera that you can buy. And it's an update to the Panasonic GH4. The GH4 has been our favorite video camera for the longest time. The, the GH4 is a little bit old though. It's like two and a half years old now, almost three years old. And when we got it, we switched over to 4K. We've been using 4K video ever since and absolutely loving it. We love 4K and the GH5 is going to make it even better. The GH5 seems to overcome many of the biggest challenges with the GH4, which only, for example, had a 16 megapixel sensor. So that bump to 20 megapixels, that's a really big bump. It means when you're taking stills, you'll get much sharper images. It has 5K stabilization in the body in the body. That's fantastic. That means you can use a fast prime lens without stabilization and get stabilized shots, either for handheld stills in low light with a really slow shutter speed, or you can shoot handheld video with a prime lens and without stabilization and not have it be as shaky. The stabilization will also work in tandem with optical image stabilization for some of the uh, Panasonic Lumix lenses, like the Leica branded 12 to 60, the 12 to 35, and the 35 to 100 f2.8 zooms. We've used this type of system before in the Olympus world, and it works fantastic. <laughs> like you can get, I've gotten handheld uh, pictures at one full second, handheld. Um, anyway, so we're really excited to have that on our favorite video camera now. It will output 4K 60 frames a second. And the video you're watching now is in 4K 30 frames a second. Some people aren't fans of 60K or 60 frames a second, but I am. The video is twice as smooth. Your human eye can most definitely perceive frame rates higher than 30 frames a second. So what it means is you can produce nice, smooth, lifelike video. Or if you're publishing at 30 frames a second or 24 frames, frames a second, it means that you can mix in little bits of slow motion. Watch TV and movies, and you'll see that they'll often mix full speed and slow speed video just to make it a little more interesting. It's an effect that a lot of filmmakers are using nowadays, so having that option either to have smooth video or to slow things down is going to be important. If you're publishing in full HD, like 1080p, uh, you can now record at 180 frames a second. So if you're publishing at 1080p 30 frames a second, that means you can do 6x slow motion. That's pretty remarkable for a $2,000 tiny little camera. One of the biggest things for me is no more crop. The GH4, when you recorded 4K video, it had a significant crop. So if you were shooting between switching between stills and video, when you switched to 4K video, suddenly the image would be like this, like it would be much more zoomed in. And you'd have to zoom back, back or you'd have to actually switch lenses. This crop was because it wasn't using the entire sensor. It had a basically uh, a 16 megapixel sensor, but it was only reading like the middle eight megapixels at a 16, 16 by nine aspect ratio. That made the readout easier. It made it less processor intensive because it didn't have to combine multiple pixels together. So just read one pixel out for each video, each pixel that it was gonna put into the video. Now it's reading out from a bigger sensor area and kind of blending that together. So that should accomplish two things. For one, you'll get uh, just better image quality out of your existing lenses. The images should be sharper and you'll be able to get more background blur. But I also hope that it will reduce the amount of noise that we see at high ISOs. And based on some of Panasonic samples, it looks like we, we are seeing cleaner images at ISO 6400. So GH4 was always a champ at ISO 6400. And even though that was its highest native ISO, we often pushed it to ISO 12,800 or 25,600 in post. 
and got satisfactory results. Based on their sample, the GH5 looks much cleaner, and because of the way they've they've changed it and advancements in image processing, uh, that doesn't surprise me. That seems feasible and not just kind of marketing fluff. By the way, we're going to have a full test on the GH5 coming up soon. Right now, we're basing it on uh, our, our comments on all the information that Panasonic has provided us and our wealth of experience, starting with the Panasonic GH2, the GH3, and, and the GH4. We've been working with them for years. We actually have a lot of them. We're excited about this. Coming up in like the summer, <laughs> they'll release a firmware update that will give the cameras 6K, in little quotes, <laughs> 24P anamorphic video. Okay, that requires some explanation. 6K video is higher resolution than 4K, but this is not true 6K. It's taking that 20 megapixel sensor and kind of, it's like a three by four 20 megapixel sensor and it's stretching it out to 16 by nine when you use anamorphic lenses. Anamorphic lenses optically kind of squish the image into a, from the world into a different shape when it hits the sensor and anamorphic lenses are extremely common in, in use for filmmakers, like proper filmmaking. Watch films, and if there's a night scene or a scene where there are lights in the background that are out of focus, if those lights are elliptical rather than circular, if they look like an oval, that's a sign that they're using anamorphic lenses. It just creates interesting out of focus bokeh effects, but it also can use that sensor uh, a little more efficiently. So it's higher resolution than 4K. It's not like a proper 6K, but it should look absolutely great. And for filmmakers to do 6K 24P, you should be able to get amazing, amazing results out of it. It's a little weird that they're publishing, they're releasing this camera, and basically I think it's March 30th, April basically, and um, scheduling firmware updates. I haven't seen a manufacturer do this before, uh, Tesla does it, the car manufacturer, where they kind of like promise stuff in advance. Let's hope Panasonic's more reliable than Tesla. Anyway, in April, we'll see an update for 422 10-bit at full HD. And then in the summer, you can see all these different firmware updates that they're promising, including this high-resolution anamorphic, which is kind of 6K. Um, they're also going to be offering HDR video, which is this kind of new thing that not too many people have experienced, but HDR video allows you to capture a greater dynamic range and also publish that greater dynamic range. So it's a little different than things like uh, V-log or S-log, like logarithmic capture, which captures more dynamic range, but then it usually gets processed out. You can actually stream that extra dynamic range to HDR displays that just make more lifelike, more real world style imagery that has more detail in the highlights and shadow. So it'll be able to capture that. And though there aren't a lot of ways to consume, not many people can consume HDR video now. It It's still nice to have. And as more and more displays come out, it'll be great to have that. They are offering H.265 support. H.265 is a video codec. It's just a codec. It's just a, a way to store the video bits in a file. Most of the time, most people are using H.264, which is one worse than H.265. H.265 compresses stuff a little bit more. And so basically, with the same file size, you can get better quality. Or with this, if you want the same quality, you can use a smaller file size. Uh, we've seen H.265 in cameras before, like the Samsung NX1. But when that came out, nobody really supported it. And now Premiere Pro has supported H.265 for a long time. And it's just for our team, we frequently transfer huge 4K files between like uh, Siobhan and Philadelphia for editing and back and forth. So having that extra bit of compression, it just would make our lives easier. We're happy to see that. Another thing we're happy to see is full HDMI. <laughs> Usually video cameras like these have mini HDMI or micro HDMI ports, and they're so flimsy that you can be recording with a field monitor connected through the HDMI and it will just come loose. So a full size HDMI port is just more solid. And we're really happy to see that. They've reduced the, uh, there's also an HDMI lock, by the way. They've reduced the sensor readout time from 22 milliseconds on the GH4 to 15 milliseconds on the GH5. And what that means is less rolling shutter. And here I have an example actually taken with the GH5 of rolling shutter. Now you can see this building is actually upright. 
but I took it from a train. I was, it was in Europe. I was going like 200 miles an hour or something. So you can see that distinct lean there. You will see rolling shutter in action scenes in movies that when they're done with cameras like these, like proper film, like serious film cameras, like the RE cameras and the red cameras, they won't have rolling shutter. They'll have a global shutter. So that sort of a, a effect artifact won't happen during action scenes or during fast pans, but it will with these cameras. It's one of the serious weaknesses of them. So the fact that they reduce that significantly, 22 to 15 milliseconds is a big jump, uh, means that they'll look a little bit better and the situations you can use it comfortably and will increase. Uh, as per the whole lineup, it has a touch screen, but I mention it because cameras that we also love, like the Sony a7R II and the Sony a7S II don't have a touch screen yet. So the fact that it has it makes focusing during video recording so much easier and just generally helps the workflow. It also has a thumbstick on the back. Uh, terribly useful. The GH4 didn't really have, the, have this. It had a directional pad, but the thumbstick will just allow you to change autofocus points in case you don't feel like using the touchscreen. They are advertising much better autofocus than the GH5. That's the kind of thing that we're going to have to test. Uh, um, it also has more autofocus points. As you can kind of see, it can track moving subjects really well, according to them. We're always a little... Uh, uh, we, we don't take this stuff for granted. We wait until we, we test it out. I do believe that the focusing will be a little bit better. I don't believe that it's ever going to match something like uh, a DSLR. And I would be really surprised if it were able to keep up with the Canon's dual pixel autofocus system, which is just remarkable. Uh, one of the big reasons is the GH4 only supports contrast-based focusing. It still does not have proper phase detect focusing, but the focusing in the GH4 has always been great for contrast-based focusing. It just never quite kept up with cameras like the even the older Canon 70D. It just wasn't quite good enough or as good for tracking video, uh, moving subjects in video. But for the most part, you're using manual focus in video anyway. They also have a really cool feature where you can use the touchscreen to tap a couple of different places in the scene, and then the GH5 will pull focus from one point to another. Pulling focus just shifts focus in a scene, and it's a common cinematic technique that uh, can require a complex focus puller and an experienced focus puller separate from your cameraman to really nail. So to have that feature built into the camera uh, can really make a much better effect. They've also improved the, the viewfinder with a, a remarkable 3.8 million dot screen. So it's just a, a very high resolution screen, higher than most viewfinders. The actual resolution seems to be 1280 by 960. So it's not even like a full HD display, but it's a pretty good display. Uh, the rear screen on the back is bigger and better too than it was on the GH4. So we're looking at 3.2 inches diagonally now and uh, 1.6 megapixels. So when you are using that rear screen, it's just going to look better. And that's so important, especially with really sharp lenses, you need to nail focus. And the more resolution you have on the screen, the more confident you can be that you got focus. It's still not matching full 4K. So you'll still have to zoom in and make sure that everything is uh, sharp at one to one. But still, that kind of thing can mean the difference between getting a shot in focus and slightly missing focus and not discovering that you blew the shot until you get back in the computer. We shoot a lot of 4K. That kind of thing does happen with these cameras. They're also building in waveforms and vector scopes into the camera itself. These are just different ways to visualize the uh, video that you're capturing so you have better confidence that everything is properly exposed and that everything is going to sound great. Um, more and more focusing points, but let's talk about the still frames per second. At the full sensor readout of 20 megapixels, it can capture 12 frames a second, which is really fast. Like that's Nikon D5 fast. However, it will only do nine frames a second with continuous autofocus, but that's still really fast. Now, you might think, okay, this is gonna be a remarkable sports camera, but for it to be a good sports camera, you need a couple of other things like an amazing focusing system and great telephoto lenses. And even the samples they show here aren't pushing the autofocus system. To push the autofocus system, you'd be using 
a 400 millimeter lens, a 600 millimeter lens, and you'd have a fast moving subject coming directly towards it. They kind of use more wide angle lenses and they had subjects kind of moving side to side in the frame. So no, it's, I, it's not going to keep up with a Nikon D5 or a Canon 1DX Mark II, but it should be good. It should be fast. If you drop the resolution down, you can get even higher frames out of it. Uh, 30 frames a second, of course, without autofocus at 18 megapixels. Uh, and you can even do this kind of cool focus stacking thing where it will, it's like focus bracketing, where it will capture an image with a, a focus slightly differently. Just in case you did miss focus, you can go back and pick the one that is sharpest. You could also use these images focused at different places and blend them together using focus stacking techniques, which could give you additional depth of field. If you're willing to drop down to just 4K resolution, 8 megapixels basically, it can even capture 60 frames a second. There are a couple of different ways to look at that. Either you could just shoot 60 frames a second stills, and then that's a lot to sort through. You could also record 4K video and go through and pick out one of those stills, either in camera or on the computer. Just different options for that. It has a cool feature called pre-burst, which we also see in the Olympus lineup, where when you actually push the shutter, well, it's kind of always recording still images. So when you actually push the shutter, it will save all the pictures that it took one second before you took the picture and one second after. And in, in theory, that sounds fantastic. Like you can imagine that uh, if you were a little late getting your kid kicking the, the ball into the soccer goal, that it would have it for you. Um, in practice, at least my, I find in high action scenarios, what I'm waiting on is actually for the camera to, for either me to frame the scene correctly or for the camera to get everything in focus. So capturing one second before then when everything's out of frame and not in focus isn't necessarily any benefit to me. Nonetheless, I can find it, it's not as nice to have, right? It's the kind of thing that I wish Canon and Nikon and even Sony would build into their cameras. It's like a software only feature that they could even give us with an update, but they don't. So thank you, Panasonic, for being forward thinking about that. Um, I mentioned post focus earlier, which does kind of focus bracketing. Um, as with the other GH series, it has both a microphone and a headphone jack, and that differentiates it from uh, like the Sony a6500, but it also differentiates it from other Panasonic cameras, which uh, usually lack one or the other. And believe it or not, a lot of vloggers don't think that you need a headphone jack. They just think you need a mic jack. And as a result, a lot of vlogging cameras don't have a headphone jack. Now, uh, I think a headphone jack is critical because I've learned the hard way that sometimes your sound gets screwed up and you don't know it until you go and listen back to your video. So even if I can't, if it, even if I'm recording myself and I can't monitor my own sound, after I record, I'll plug the headphones in and I'll listen back and just make sure I nailed it. Anyway, it has that and it's important, but not everybody <laughs> appreciates that. I also want to talk about the importance of the electronic viewfinder in case you're comparing this to something like the uh, Nikon D500, which records 4K, and uh, uh, but is a DSLR. The D500 and other DSLRs don't have the electronic viewfinder, so you can't use the viewfinder when you're recording video. The viewfinder is so important when recording video because you, in bright sun, you often just can't see the rear display at all. But to be able to put your eye up there and block out all the sun uh, is really, really helpful. That's why mirrorless cameras are so useful for videos. Uh, unlike, say, the Sony cameras, it doesn't have that 30-minute recording limit. They've The GH cameras didn't have that in the U.S. before, but they did have it in Europe and Panasonic has removed that limit, even for European versions of the camera. Some of you are going to be excited about this 422. That's extra color depth. And we did really detailed testing of the GH4 and higher, um, higher color depth recordings. And we couldn't find, we couldn't see any real differences, even when we heavily pushed it. But some people insist on 422, especially if you're working with a green screen or you're really heavily grading things. Uh, if you're really heavily grading things, then you can start to see some jagginess in the color when it's really heavily pushed. And this just captures more color information. Now, the 422 uh, will record internally at 
30 frames a second and 4K, but it can do 60 frames a second if you're using recording to an external recorder or something like the Atomos uh, Shogun. Um, the 422 10-bit will be available in April as a result of a firmware update. Panasonic is also offering really just fat files, just big, just big data, 400 megabits a second. That's going to make a big, big video file, but you should have just tons of quality in there. Like basically what it means is even in a scene that had really fast panning, you shouldn't see any sort of compression artifacts in there because it's not having to compress things really tight. Um, the all intra is just a video codec that makes it's supposed to make editing a little bit easier, but honestly, I've edited all intra and IPB and other formats, and I've not noticed a huge practical difference in how Premiere Pro responded, but it's the layout of the video file itself that supposed to, supposedly makes it easier for you to make cuts. So your program should respond quicker. I just haven't seen that in my own practice. Um, it is weather sealed. Now, the GH4s before it were pretty well weather sealed. And, and I'll tell you a story. We took two GH4s and two Canon 5D series cameras hiking in Montana. We got caught in a flash flood and all the cameras got soaked. The two Canons died and never could be repaired. The two GH4s were fine. <laughs> so in that case, in a real side-by-side -side test, the GH4s outperformed the Canon 5Ds, which are supposed to be high-end weatherproofed cameras. Um, unfortunately, there's no good way for us to test the weather sealing because we're not going to like get a whole bunch of expensive cameras and kind of equally soak them all and see which is better. But it's good news that they weather sealed it because sometimes you do just get caught in the rain. The maximum mechanical shutter speed is 1 8,000th of a second, which is pretty typical of DSLRs too. If you switch to the electronic shutter, you can go up to 1 16,000th of a second. That's better than DSLRs tend to do. They added dual SD cards, which is kind of a, a fairly unusual thing in these mirrorless cameras, so several of them have it. You can use the dual SD cards to either write still images to both cards at the same time in case there's a failure. It can also write video files to both at the same time. Uh, you can also use them to overflow. So that's a big plus. I'm excited to see that uh, in use for video because memory cards do fail. And the last thing you want is to shoot all day and then not have anything to show for it because a piece of cheap hardware failed. It has wireless capabilities, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and NFC. Uh, I'm excited to see the Bluetooth component of it because they Panasonic is advertising that it's going to allow you to stream pictures in the background. And we just have to kind of see how that actually works in practice because it could be dodgy. Nikon has something similar, the SnapBridge, which is sometimes it works great and sometimes it's a little frustrating. They've upgraded it to USB 3.1 with type C. That's good though. This isn't a camera we typically tether like in the studio. That's good and it's a nice to have especially if you're transferring images from it if you want xlr connections xlr connections are just big fat audio connections uh, you can get the dmw xlr1 and uh, run your xlr mics into it it also gives you a little more control over the audio so some of you use xlr mics and you just need to have this and there it is it's a little bit better i like it better than the gh4's version of this because this goes into the hot shoe on top rather than connecting onto the bottom it's also got a little cold shoe on there in case you want to run like a shotgun mic on, or something like that on top of it uh great design on that panasonic it has iaf so it'll focus on an eye in a portrait though how practical that is remains to be seen um Let's compare the GH5 to some of the other cameras. Here it is side by side with the GH4, courtesy of CameraSize.com. You can see the GH5 has gotten significantly bigger. They they look similar, though I think they've gone for more of an angular design aesthetic here, something that I really like. Most of the controls on the back are about the same, but you will see that thumbstick right above the LCD screen there. That's going to be a big improvement. Um, from the top, not much difference, except they have may put a big record button there kind of showing that yeah they recognize that everybody's using these for video cameras comparing the features side by side with the gh4 it's going to be real hard to justify buying a new gh4 when the gh5 is only 600 dollars more it has 4k 60 frames a second higher resolution still image sensor of real full-size hdmi out hdmr video less rolling shutter 
and so many other things that I couldn't even fit on the slide that I've been talking about. It just really blows the GH4 away. And the GH4 was still winning so many video camera comparisons that we were doing. The GH4 is still a great camera. I will say on the used market, you can pick up a GH4 for under a grand now. It's a fantastic value. So the GH5 new, of course, you won't be able to get it used because it'll be pretty new, is going to be quite a bit more than that. The price point is almost exactly the same as the Olympus EM1 Mark II, which we should be reviewing against the GH5 soon. And that's kind of rough for Olympus. I think Olympus is actually going to have to drop the price point down because the GH4 uh, has just so many solid features that the EM1 lacks. And really, one of the few things that the EM1, there are little things the EM1 has that the GH4, GH5 lacks. But the biggest thing is just that the EM1 is a little bit smaller. So if compactness is really important to you, the EM1 is going to be better. But both are like big cameras, like especially for mirrorless cameras. They don't feel small even compared to like an APS-C DSLR. So they're bigger than even their sensor sizes would indicate. The GH5 compared to the Sony A6500, they both record full frame video, um, but you can see the a6500 is substantially, substantially smaller. The GH5 also has a DSLR design, so the viewfinder is in the middle, whereas the A6500 has the viewfinder in the upper left corner. It means it doesn't run into your nose, assuming you use your right eye, but if you use your left eye, it can actually, the GH5 would probably fit you better. The A6500 is less expensive, and it records 4K 30 frames a second, but the GH5 feature-wise beats it in almost every way. And I know if I had to pick one for video, it would definitely be the GH5. For stills, the A6500 is definitely going to win because it has a sensor that's like has basically twice the sensor area. So at any given ISO, it's probably going to have about half as much noise. The A6500 also has proper phase detect and really a pretty powerful focusing system. So I'm confident for stills and video, the A6500 would focus better. We hope to compare those two cameras. Subscribe to see that. I'm really excited about the GH5. There were a few things that I wish were different, but for the most part, Panasonic has really nailed this. There's no raw video. And no other camera in this segment has raw video, so it's weird for me to complain about it. The only camera that really does is the um, camera that DJI is putting into the Inspire 2 drone. So that seems weird, but it also uses a micro four thirds sensor and a micro four thirds mount, and it does allow you to record raw video. So it could be done. Raw video would just allow more kind of exposure latitude. I will say the GH5 largely overcomes that by allowing you to install like the uh, optional high dynamic range option, which should cost you a couple of extra bucks. As I mentioned before, the GH5 is only contrast focusing. Another kind of nitpicky thing, the base ISO on the GH5 is still ISO 200. That means that it will produce about the same amount of noise and still images as ISO 800 on a full frame camera. And if you use a full frame camera at ISO 800 and you you care about noise at all, you probably notice that ISO 800 on a full frame camera has a substantial amount of noise. That means, and this is consistent with our experiences, ISO 200 uh, on, on a micro four thirds camera is noisy. You look in the sky, you'll see substantial amounts of noise, especially in the shadows. There'll be lots of noise, and that's the cleanest you can possibly produce. I really wish Panasonic could get that ISO down. I'd love to see ISO, even ISO 25, for when you have enough light to get just really clean images out of that new 20 megapixel non anti alias sensor. For detailed information about why that's important, visit stp.io slash crop. It's still 20 megapixels, a big step up from 16 megapixels, but it's still only 20 megapixels. And for stills, I'm totally hooked on my Canon 5DSR, which has 50 megapixels. I, when I shoot with the DA10, which has 36 megapixels, or the Sony a7R II, which has 42 megapixels, I feel a little deprived. Like, I love lots of megapixels. If you think that's stupid, go to stp.io slash mp and just watch the video where I just kind of demonstrate the practical uses for higher megapixels. I understand this is a video-centric camera. I would love to have it be the best camera for stills and video. Sure. Chelsea just uh, offered to bring me a beer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Um, another weakness is that it doesn't have GPS. They say that you'll be able to use the, G the Bluetooth to tie into your phone and uh, get the GPS and data from your phone. So that'll be nice, but I still wish it kind of had it built in. It's easy 
and it doesn't cost much. Like every smartphone has GPS built in. And when you take stills and they're GPS tagged, you can see them on a map in Lightroom. And that's makes finding those images so much easier for landscape photographers. It also makes it easier to find a way back to a spot. Something we see on high-end video cameras is a built-in ND filter, which will allow you to use a slower shutter speed, even in bright light. And this doesn't have that. So basically you have to take an ND filter or a, gra or a variable ND and stick it on the front of your lens, just like you probably have been. It's a, it's a nice to have. Of course, we have more tests coming soon. We hope to be one of the first people to get our hands on it. So subscribe to see those, a really detailed comparison. I'll also plug my book, Stunning Digital Photography. 14 hours of video teaches you the art of photography, things like mood, storytelling, composition, posing, you know, important stuff, more important than the gear that you use. Uh, books on Lightroom and Photoshop and a whole book dedicated to selecting the best camera gear. The eBooks are available for 10 bucks. The paperbacks are available for about 20 bucks. You can check it out on Amazon, see all the reviews there. And you can also order it worldwide at sdp.io slash store. Comment with any questions or corrections. Sometimes we make mistakes on these things and give me a like, share with your friends and subscribe. Bye.